Before we start our lesson this morning, a couple things I want to remind you of. First, I want to say welcome. We're glad you're here. If this is your first time at Clear Creek, we hope you'll stick around. We want to get to know you. We don't want you to visit long. We'd love for you to be part of the church family here at Clear Creek. So uh, we're, we're so glad that you're here this morning, and we hope that you'll be back often as you can, uh, as much as you can. We'd love to have you as part of our church family. Uh, a couple things I want to remind you of, or actually one of them's new, I want to remind you. First, we have our very first issue of Celebration magazine. It's a magazine we're going to start doing on a quarterly basis at the church here. And, and it's kind of an, a recap of our summer. And it's going to be available to you on your way out of the auditorium this morning. They didn't want to give it to you on your way in because you'd read it while I preach, and that's a bad thing. So uh, we didn't want to tempt you with that magazine. So you can get that magazine on the way out, and it's got a lot of really cool stuff in there, information about things that have happened, good things, uh, wins here at Clear Creek over the last a few months. And hopefully this is something we're going to be doing on a quarterly basis so you can look forward to, to more of these uh, magazines. The other thing is, is this weekend is National Neighborhood Weekend. Tomorrow is National Neighbors Day. We know that there are many small groups in this church who have already had a block party uh, for your neighborhood to encourage your neighbors, really the chance to get to meet them and, and see if there's some way that you can start this bless method in their life. If you walked in and saw bless, uh, we, we teach the blessed method of discipleship. We begin with prayer. We listen to these people who are around us. We listen for signs that uh, they're ready to, uh, to, to attach to someone who may mentor them into a relationship with Christ. We eat with them, which is my favorite. And then we uh, share, we, we serve them, and then we share our story with them. And so over the weekend, there's been a lot of that going on. If you're not part of one of those groups that have had the block party, I want to give you a homework assignment. I want you tomorrow, which is National Neighbors Day, to uh, look for your neighbors, not in that creepy, stalking way, but look for your neighbors, and if you don't know them, just introduce yourself to your neighbors. It's just, it's a start, and so as a church, we need to be out there reaching our community for Christ because we only do one thing, right guys? We find people who don't know Jesus, and we bring them into a life-changing relationship with Jesus by connecting them with God and one another. That's really all we do. So I hope you'll do that, and you'll start that with your neighbors. If it's not this weekend, maybe it'll be tomorrow. Just kind of look for your neighbor's opportunity to, to say hello to one of them. Let's pray before we start. God, you're an amazing God. We thank you uh, for the blessings in this life. We thank you for the opportunity to be here and to worship your name. You're the only God that's true, the only God that is living, and the only God that's deserving of worship and honor and praise. We come here this morning to tell you that first and foremost. As we sing praises and we look into your word this morning, our, our, our prayer is that our hearts can be touched and we can come to know you better. Uh, we, you are mysterious at best to many of us for our thoughts aren't your thoughts and our ways aren't your ways. So, Father, as we ask that we be able to gain insight and we be able to encourage others with what we, what we hear, what we see, what we learn this morning. Uh, lift us up. We know there are people in this church that are hurting and are broken. They're going through uh, struggles uh, that we can't imagine. And we know that your hand can be upon them, and we pray that they'll always know that you're near. Most importantly, Father, we all sin and fall short of your glory, and uh, we pray that you'll forgive us, that you'll see us through the blood of your Son, and especially the Speaker. He, he's just a man. And so this morning, as we gather together, we come to lift up your name in the name of your Son, Jesus. And amen. We're in the second part of a five-part series on, called FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions, Common Questions for Uncommon People. And last week we talked about the question, does God exist, or how do we know that God exists? And through chat rooms online, I've gone online and i found five questions that are come, actually the most frequently asked questions that either atheists or agnostics or people who are trying to find their faith will ask people who are sharing the gospel story with them. And since we're going to be missionaries going out in our community and we're going to be sharing the gospel story with people, it's good to know, you know, how do we answer some of these questions? So last week, how does God exist? Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about are people who have never heard the gospel or practice other religions going to hell? I mean, that's a question that we need to be able to answer. Also, uh, the week after, how can I be certain that my decisions and my choices are God's will for my life? That's a big question. That's asked, you know, Christians are asking that question all the time. And lastly, uh, because of the culture that we live in, what is the gospel's response to sexual immorality, including same-sex 
uh, attraction? How, how do we deal with all the things going on in our life, the sexual immorality, and what is the gospel response to that? And that's kind of the key words there. So I hope you'll be here for that. This morning, we're going to talk about if God is loving and just, why does he allow suffering and injustice? And it's an interesting question. It's a question for the ages. You know, why do bad things happen to good people? And inside this question, there is an inference. Because the question that's being asked really is this. If God allows evil and suffering to continue, or suffering and injustice to continue, and he can't do anything about it, then God might be good, but he's certainly not all-powerful or sovereign. Or, flip side of this, if God allows evil, suffering, and injustice to occur, which we all agree that he allows that to occur, if God allows that and can do something about it but chooses not to, then is he not, he, he might be sovereign, but is he, not, is he good? And so the question is, this God that we're sharing with our community, we say that he's a good God and that he's a sovereign God, but the evidence that people derive from suffering and evil being in the neighborhood and in our communities and in our world, they'll take it back and say, well, how can a good God let all that happen? That's a great question. Um, our tendency is to externalize this. When the truth is, we should be internalizing this. You see, uh, a lot of times when we think about suffering and injustice, we think about everybody else. We say, how can God allow those people to do those things? For instance, how could God allow those people to cause those planes to crash in those locations? How can God allow that person to drive up and massacre other people? Or how can God allow human trafficking to take place? These are big things, and we always say, how can God allow those people to do those things? The problem is, is we need to internalize this and look at the reality of suffering and injustice. Poll. We'll do a quick poll, and at Clear Creek, it's okay to raise your hands in church if you'd really like to, and I'm about to... I, I would do the old poll, you know. How many of you are willing to raise your hand in church? Raise your hand, and you will. And then you ask, how many of you would never raise your hand in church? Please raise your hand. And you always catch one, right? I don't know what happened there. I'm glad I'm not dead. It was an assassination attempt. Let's ask this question. How many of you in here have ever been on the receiving end of pain, hurtfulness, or injustice? How many of you have never been on the receiving end of pain, hurtfulness, or injustice? Never. Well, good, you didn't have to raise your hand in church. That's great. Okay, next question. How many of you in here have never caused pain, hurtfulness, or injustice for someone else. Good, you're honest people. Nobody raised their hands. And that's where I want to lead you this morning. I want you to realize that we live in a world of suffering and injustice, and it's not somebody else's doing. We all, to some degree, participate in the suffering and injustice in our world, even if it's on a small level of saying something horrible to a parent or to a child. Or, or saying something to a coworker that you know is going to be hurtful, and, and we, we do these things. Last week, I, I quoted a book uh, called, um, uh, let's see, it's called Everything New, and it's uh, a book by Jeff Cook. And in this book, there's another quote I wanted to share with you this morning. It basically says this, if God had created a world without pain, none of us would be, have been invited. Because apparently, we are the kind of people who willingly cause pain. At the end of the day, hurting other people is the only thing in which all of us are really skilled. You see, d despite our best efforts, we all hurt other people, and we all add to the suffering and the injustice in this world. So to some degree, we all contribute to this. The problem is, is we want to argue the degree, 
They're worse because they do something that we consider to be worse. But the truth is, is we live in a world of suffering and injustice, and we're just as guilty to contributing to, uh, of contributing to it as anyone else. So that begs the question. If that's our world, and we're those people, the first point this morning is, the reason God created the world this way is, why would God create a world like we live in? You know, why would God create a world like this with people like us? Another quote that I don't have on the board for you from uh, Jeff Cook's book, it says, for some inexplicable reason known only to God, he thinks that people like us should be here. The desire for a world with no human frailty, fault, or brokenness is actually a request for our own elimination. Why would God create a world like this? Well, the answer actually is in the very beginning of your Bibles. And I'm going to tell the story rather than have you turn to it. And thank you, Steve, for your kind compliment this morning. The greatest compliment you can give a preacher is that he asked somebody to look at the Word, and they did. But I want to tell you the story. I want to take you back to the creation. In the beginning, God spoke this world into existence. And he created a garden. We call it the Garden of Eden. And in this Garden of Eden, there was everything that man needed in order to live a full, whole, rich life. And if you agree with me there, just shake your head. Okay, we've sh- got heads nodding. And in the middle of this garden, there was a tree. No, there were two trees. In the middle of this garden, there were two trees. There was a tree of life, and there was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he went to man, and he said this, Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for if you do, you will surely Die. Die? What does that mean? No one had ever died before. But for some reason, they knew that that wasn't a good thing. So what did they do? They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you're saying, where are you going with this, Joy? From the very beginning of this world, God created a world of choice. It was a world of choice, and you have two avenues that you can take. You can take one avenue to where you, you, you hunger for and you pursue the godliness of, that, that comes from living a righteous life. Or you can also choose not to do that. You see, God created a world of choice to where we can live a whole, full life where our choices can lead to growth and can lead to transformation. Or we can live a life that does just the opposite. You see, I believe that the question, if God is loving and just, why does he allow suffering and injustice, is actually not looking at the nature of God closely enough. Because God allowed choices, I believe that God is loving and just, and that instead of being an absentee God, who he really is, is a God who is gracious. And here's proof one, evidence one. Peter is writing a, a letter to, he, he writes his first letter to these five churches at Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And he writes a, a second letter, and, and there's a question that keeps coming to Peter. The world is so bad, Peter, why doesn't God just end it all and carry us home? And there were people who were saying there can't be a God because God wouldn't allow this to exist. Why, why would God allow this to stand? Why doesn't he just end it all and take his family home? And, and Peter answers them this way in 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness. But he is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Let's frame this. What this verse of Scripture is saying, God knows who you are. He knows the world you live in. Now, this is a God who spoke a world into existence. His voice caused the universe. In everything that we know, the vastness of the galaxies and the vastness of the universe, the vastness of this world, he knows you. Everything about you. And he's patient with you. Not patient with mankind in general. He is patient with you. Not wanting anyone to perish, but for everyone to have the opportunity to choose growth and transformation, meaning he wants all to come to repentance. 
We live in a world like this because God wants us to choose him. And the obvious downside is there are many people who don't. There are many people who will choose to be destructive. They'll choose their own destruction. They'll choose the destruction of others. And usually do it for a couple of reasons. One is they choose it because of their own suffering, their own pain, their own injustice. Therapists will usually tell you a, a phrase that hurt people hurt people. And that's true. Sometimes hurt people hurt each other out of their own pain. Sometimes it's just opportunity. They're not necessarily hurting people, but they have the opportunity to hurt someone, and they think that they can get away with it, and that part of their nature that we can't always understand does things like this. But it's because God has created a world of choice. Now, here's the, the real crux, and the next two points is really where we get the real crux. If God created a world like this, is he an absentee God? I mean, is he a God that, that kind of set this world into motion, knowing it'd be a world of choice, knowing that people would choose wrong, and he just kind of backed away and just let whatever happened happen? And the only way we can really answer these questions is to first look backward. We have to look back, and we have to look at a special event in time. Now, you go back to 1 Peter. 1 Peter is written to those five churches I mentioned before. And they were going through tremendous amounts of suffering. And Peter's letter, if you really look at this letter and read between the lines, what he's doing is he's saying, I know you're suffering. I know you feel injustice. Here's the good news. It's not going to get any better. And then he says, but you're not alone. In 1 Peter 1, verses 6 through 9, the Word of God tells this, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, those, those unexpected things that break our hearts, so that the proof of your faith, which more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. He says that the testing of your faith that comes with the suffering and the injustice in the world is like fire. If you've ever been hurt, if you've ever felt brokenness, if you've ever been discriminated against, if you've ever felt unjustly accused, anything in your life, you know the fire and the hurt and the pain that comes with that. And what he's saying here is he's saying, you're not alone. Fire is usually something that goes along with the idea of testing and trial and, and, and all those things that create in, in us or usually are created by suffering and injustice. There's a story in the Old Testament about three young men. They were told by King Nebuchadnezzar that they were going to bow at his feet and they were to worship him as God. And they refused to do that. And so what he did is he created a furnace that was so hot that the people who were creating the furnace became, uh, uh, became inflamed, died creating the furnace. It was that hot. And he put Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in this fiery furnace. The fiery furnace, it, it, it it was a literal reality, but it also represents this suffering and injustice that we go through, these fires that we go through in our life. And we turn to the book of Daniel, and, and we look in chapter 3, verse 24 and 25, and we read this. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and stood up with haste, and he said to his high officials, Was it not three men that were cast bound in the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, Certainly, O king. He said, Look, I see four men. Loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar, who was not a believer in God, couldn't fathom this fourth person because it was God, it was Jesus himself in this flame with these people walking through the fire with them. And then we turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, and we read Isaiah's statement about who God is. And he says, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, look at this real carefully. When you walk through the fire, not if you walk through the fire, when you walk through the fire, when you deal with suffering and justice, you'll not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. Why? For I am the Lord your God, 
the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And what he's saying here is he's saying this, you are not alone, but it's deeper than that. We go back and we look at what Peter said to this church. He said, you understand these fire of, of, of suffering and injustice. But we also go back further than Peter's words. We go back to a place called Golgotha, to the cross. And as Jesus hangs on the cross, in seven phrases, he preaches an entire sermon that we will remember the rest of our lives. But one of the things he says in Matthew chapter 27, which is a quote from uh, the 22nd Psalm, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What a question from what a person. We know that he's quoting the 22nd Psalm, and you go back and read that Psalm. It's a Psalm of suffering, and it's a Psalm of victory. But the question is this. Why would he say it? Why would he say that as he drew his last breath on the cross? It's because he wanted us to know something. You see, often when we talk about the cross, we get teary-eyed and we, we, we get really upset because of the physical pain that Jesus went through on the cross when the truth is that there have been people who have died since then that have gone through more agonizing pain for longer periods of time. So what makes his pain unique is what was really happening in his heart on that cross. You see, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 tells us this. That he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might be the righteousness of God in him. On that cross, as Jesus bled, as Jesus was impaled, as Jesus went through everything that he went through, he went through more. He felt every pain that mankind will ever feel. From the beginning of time to the end of time, every transgression, every suffering, every injustice, everything that has created a fire in our lives, he felt. To the young woman who's been trapped in human trafficking and abused night after night, and she cries out, where are you, God? He's there. He felt that. To those people who didn't even believe in him being the son of God trapped in a concentration camp. Wondering, where are you, God? He's there. And he felt that. And whatever you're going through, whatever fire you're in, on that day, on that cross, he felt that. And this is a double-sided coin because we are who we are. For every pain you've ever felt, Jesus felt that pain on the cross. For every fire you've ever been through, Jesus felt that fire on the cross. And for every fire you've ever caused, he felt that too. You see, we don't have an absentee God. He gave us a God of choice and he waged through that choice with us. And the beauty is, not only do we understand this question of the absentee God by looking backward, we also understand it by looking forward. You see... We have, as a living hope, a historical event that can't be denied by historians, and that's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, we go back and we look at what Peter is writing to these people, and he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. It's reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Here's what he's saying. If you've taken on the likeness of his death, you'll also share in the likeness of his resurrection. We have hope. But it's bigger than that because I want you to understand the resurrection this morning and I've got four more minutes to do it. We look at this event, we look at this historical event and we have to understand the fullness of what's going on there. Because when we look forward, what we're looking forward to is our resurrection. It's, it, it's the time when we will go to be with God. When we will leave this place for a reward that Jesus has prepared for us with his own hands. But we have to understand what's happening there. 
Because the resurrection is not just the end of suffering as we know it. It is the incorporation of suffering. You see, it is not some compensation that we're going to get in the future for what we have to wade through here. But the resurrection is restoral, is life as it should be. All that we've lost through our suffering and injustice here, we will have returned to us. Great verse of scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 54 through 57. He says this, But when this perishable puts on the imperishable, this mortal is put on immortality. Then we'll come about to saying this written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Guys, there's a day coming for all those who love Jesus and been faithful to his calling. We're going to be home. We're going to be raised. But that resurrection is not going to be something that is just the end of pain and the beginning of utopia. Death will be swallowed up in victory. All that is lost will be found. You want to understand that even better? Have you ever lost anything, some, anything that was really, really important and dear to you? And then you found it? What does the value of that thing become once you find it? You may have lost something simple like a piece of jewelry that you carelessly set somewhere, but it was a family heirloom. And when you found it, didn't it seem just more important to you? Wasn't it even more special because it had been lost and been found? And for some of you young parents, you may understand this. I remember my children learning to drive. And I remember the very first time both of them took a car by themselves and went somewhere without me or Melissa in the car with them. And they were gone for hours. And I remember sitting there and thinking about those children during those hours thinking, will they come back? Because they're horrible drivers. <laughs> and I remember how I felt when they walked in the door. That's how you're gonna feel. Death will be swallowed up in victory. All the pain, all the suffering, everything we go through will be incorporated in it because what he's going to do is he's going to say, you get everything back. All that was lost through suffering and pain, all that was lost through injustice in this world, you get it all back because death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? Guys, we have hope. You see, we have a God who gives us choice, but he's not an absentee God. Because even through the pain and suffering caused by bad choice in this world, he has entered into our life so that we could enter into his death. He has entered into our suffering so that we could enter into his death. And not only that, through his resurrection, he says, I'm not an absentee God, I'm a present God. I came and took care of this problem. And there's coming a day where all the suffering and all the injustice is not just going to end, it's going to be made right. Let's pray. God, you're a good God. Thank you for this day and for this message. We can't wait till it's made right. Father, we know that uh, this world's not as you would want it to be, that, that sin is throughout this world and that suffering and justice is caused by those choices, the same choices that were made even in the garden. Our prayer is that we as people will consider our choices. That we'll choose to honor you by the way we live, by the way we treat one another, and that we realize that when we go through these fires, you're not, you're not an absentee God. You're with us. You are loving and just, but you wade into our suffering, and you enter into our injustices, and we're never alone. May we look for you in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray, and amen.